Recently, I completed several beginner's guides to help newbies into the airgun scene. Today, it's a big one. It's the turn of the PCP rifles. <laughs> Hello and welcome to AAR on Air. Yes, it's a big one today, PCPs for beginners. Hopefully we will answer most of the questions a newbie would ask, and who knows, maybe we can also introduce a thing or two to the old hands too. This beginners series has proven to be very successful, and has brought quite a few new guys into the sport, certainly judging by the really nice positive comments that we've received. So, I make no excuses for doing this series. This one is a huge project, and I even thought about putting it into a book form at one time. I have broken it down into different sections and given the main section titles in the details below, just in case you want to go straight to a specific area. Anyway, enough of that. Where shall we start? Safety. This part is paramount and should never be forgotten. Don't play around with these things, they are dangerous, that is not airsoft and is not meant to be used to shoot at each other. Fingers off triggers until you're ready to fire, keep safeties on, don't go around with loaded guns and don't cock them until you intend to shoot them. There needs to be a lot of common sense use, so please respect the gun, be aware of people around you and remember you represent the shooting community. And don't be doing anything silly that will result in greater legislation being applied to the sport where it really isn't needed. That said, let's start with what is a PCP rifle? PCP stands for Precharged Pneumatic. Putting it simply, all air guns need air to send a projectile downrange. Simple really. But how do we get that to happen? Well, we could get it to work using a spring to force compressed air behind the pellet or BB or slug. We'll cover that off later. This particular method is not unlike a bicycle pump, only the stroke is a lot faster and a lot more powerful in fact. But that's the basic principle of a springer. But they only get one shot per action. Alternatively, we could use a pre-supplied power source, such as a CO2 canister, which is used very successful in a lot of guns, pistols and rifles alike. But this can give a limited number of shots per canister, especially if you're using the smaller 12 gram item. And if you use the bigger 88 grams item, they can actually work out rather expensive. Certainly if you're looking to send pellets out at any reasonable velocity, because the faster you want to send the pellets and the heavier the pellet is, the more air you're likely to need. And at around £8 per cartridge, it's soon going to run away with you. So there is a method of charging the gun up using its own fitted reservoir with a system that controls the amount of air that is released for each shot. This can be either a simple system or a regulated system using an inbuilt regulator or even electronically controlled systems. But the simple fact is you carry your own air in the gun ready to use when needed. And this will allow multiple shots and more shots than a Springer. And it's more cost effective than using CO2 guns. Certainly once you've set up, the size and shape of these reservoirs can vary greatly depending on the style and power requirements. While some people don't like the look of these cylinders on guns, certainly when they're on show, there are guns that have smaller capacity cylinders and these are hidden in the gun, such as the Ed Gun Leshy, for example. They do, however, open up more opportunities for the guns. Multi-shot capability with the aid of magazines. Again, we'll look at this later. Quick loading, semi-automatic fire, and even automatic fire possibilities. But these options can be very restricted depending on where you are in the world and the local laws permitting. Whilst there are many Puritans in all sports, there are some in the air gun world who are convinced that Springer guns are the only way to go. But the PCP does allow for quicker loading and firing 
And because there are no springs moving around at higher speeds, there is less or no recoil on most PCP guns, which means the gun is more still and stable when shooting, adding to accuracy, certainly for beginners. So how do we get the air into the fitted cylinder then? There are several methods available, some requiring more effort than others. The three main ones are pump, air tank and compressor. The pressure these guns run at removes the ability to use anything that would be used around, say, a car tyre, for example. Because unlike a car tyre that will run at about 2.5 bar or 35 psi, for example, some of these need up to 300 bar or 4,000 plus psi. Hence, you're going to need to factor in the cost of a charging method. Let's first of all look at the pump. These can cost you anywhere between around £30 UK up to around £180 UK, depending on the type, quality and the manufacturer. They will require some effort though. Firstly, you're going to need to connect the pump into the gun, usually via the supplied fitting. Once connected, close off the air bleed valve on the pump and commence pumping. Now there's a bit of a knack to this and it's best if you pump with your whole body and not just your arms, especially if you're a, light, a slighter or lighter individual. It will also get stiffer as you balance the pressures between the pump and the gun. Continue to pump until you reach your gun's ideal maximum fill pressure as per the manufacturer's recommendations. You can see that you've got there by the gauge either on the pump or on the gun. But once you've done that, stop. Release the air held in the connecting pipe by opening that air valve once it's emptied and stopped hissing, then and only then remove the valve from the gun and you're good to go. Alternatively, you can use the diver's tank method. Now these can range from anywhere between 100 and 300 pounds UK, depending on the size and the material it's made from. Bear in mind the bigger they are, the heavier they are. But of course, you hold far more air and there are far more fill-ups. They come in various sizes, ranging from 3 litres through to 12 litres. These will require repeat filling, usually from a local diver's shop, and will cost somewhere in the region of about £5 per fill-up. And should fill your gun for about 20 times plus, depending on the size of the tank and the size of the cylinder on your gun. Now this takes the heavy work out of the pumping, but adds to the cost a little. And it does involve trips to the shop to get it refilled from time to time, depending on how much shooting you do and what power levels your guns are. A sub 12 foot pound gun may give you as many as 450 shots per fill, but a higher power gun, say 100 foot pounds plus, may only give you a dozen or so. Of course, that means more trips to get the tank filled again. Filling the gun from the tank is pretty much the same process as filling it from the pump. Connect the fitting, close off the bleed valve, connect to the gun, and then open the main valve slowly. The reason you fill it up slowly is because it can cause high heat when you're filling too fast, which doesn't do the seals or the cylinders any good. Now it needs to be filled in conjunction with the manufacturer's recommendation. If you do that, it will help the gun last far longer. Once up to pressure, close the main valve, then open the bleed valve to remove the excess air which is held in the pipe. Once you've done that, then you can remove it from the gun. Now, as I've stated, you need to do this in conjunction with the manufacturer's specification. It's best done slowly to protect the gun's seals and help longevity. If you do it a little too fast, you will be able to feel the cylinder on the gun start to get hot. Finally, there's the option of the compressor. This can be a very expensive option if you only shoot very occasionally, but can work out ultimately cost-effective if you shoot a lot or higher power guns. 
they cost from around £160 UK up to about £2,500, depending on which one you go for. They vary in speed of fill-up, quality of manufacturer, power sources and quality of air they produce. Some are capable of producing breathing quality air by using a system of high quality filters. Other may have no filters at all, but you can even buy filters separately if required. I have completed a full review on these, which is available to see here. Filling these, again, is very similar to the methods that we've already shown. Simply connect the fitting to the gun, close off the bleed valve, start the pump and it will fill up to the preset levels. Or if no auto cutoff is fitted, watch the gauge until it reaches the desired level. Stop the pump, open the bleed valve and then remove from the gun. Again, it is charged up and ready. Some of these compressors need mains voltage and others can even be used from 12 volt sources from your vehicle, for example, that can then be used out in the field. You can even use some compressors to fill divers tanks. The air quality is that good. So naturally, it's going to help protect your gun. But of course, that sort of tank is going to cost a lot more. I should also mention that divers tanks are available in much lighter materials, but they are very expensive and probably for the really serious shooters who carry them around with them. Please also bear in mind that divers tanks also have a date on them, at which point they will need to be tested and certified to be safe to use. This is normally five yearly, unless of course you are using them to actually dive with when this becomes annual. But air guns don't work underwater. <laughs> Why have a PCP? Well, that could be why have an air gun, or why have a PCP rather than a Springer, or a CO2 powered gun. Well, in part, I've already covered this, but I will be producing a Springer versus PCP, and why have an air gun program. That may be out before this, or very shortly afterwards, so hit the subscribe button and the bell so you don't miss these. They can be used for small pest control or bigger pest control if you live in countries that allow higher power air guns, either with or without the need for licences. They can be used for paper target shooting, which is a favourite of mine, and it doubles up as practice for when you're actually out using them for pest control. It could simply be using a lower power gun for plinking in your back garden and having fun with the family, teaching them gun discipline with a safer, lower powered gun and having fun in the process. There are so many other shooting disciplines within the air gun sport as well. Power. Well, as I've already hinted at, different countries have different laws around air guns and indeed guns in general. And you should check out the ones relevant to your area or country first. In England, for example, there are some quite simple laws and I will be doing a future programme to show the finer points of this sometime in the future. But, putting it simply, you need to be over 18 with identification and no personal restrictions applied to you and you can have a rifle powered of less than 12 foot pounds. This being an energy figure that guns use as a power guide. Or, if it's a pistol, then that has to be less than six foot pounds in power. And that's really due to the fact that a pistol is smaller and easier to carry or swing around and conceal, and it's considered to be more dangerous. It is possible, of course, to have higher powered items. And it seems at the moment the sky is the limit on the power levels. There was a time when a 100 foot pound gun was considered to be at the high end of the available power, but there are now much more powerful guns available, predominantly in such places as the USA, where in some states gun laws are far more relaxed and they have much more open spaces available to them for longer range shooting. And of course, the pests are bigger too. Don't forget, of course, the more powerful they are, then the fewer shots that you're going to get available from each fill. So, more power equals harder hitting and longer ranges available to you. But that doesn't necessarily mean better. 
the phrase sledgehammer to crack a nut comes to mind. It's more about the right tool for the job. This can, of course, be managed on a single gun if the gun has power adjusters, as indeed some do, allowing you to have one gun that is more capable of being used in more circumstances. Of course, these can be more expensive for the gun, this re but it does reduce the need to have more than one gun in certain circumstances. Types of gun. There are a whole host of different guns available to you and surely there is going to be one that suits most everybody out there and manufacturers are thinking up new and exciting ideas all the time. I swear they do it to keep me spending money when they make them so desirable. But that aside, here are a few types. There is the standard familiar rifle shape with a simple wooden stock. This one is beech and has a small air cylinder under the barrel. It is a 10 round bolt action gun, which is good for a couple of hundred shots in this lower powered version. It is classed as a carbine rather than a rifle, which basically means it is slightly shorter than a rifle and makes it a little less gainly and easier to move about in tighter spaces. You could change the design to an even shorter folding design that can be packed away in your bag for easy transportation. This is a single shot version that can only be shot once unfolded fully. It has a pistol grip and even has the ability to change the barrels for different calibers. We'll look into calibers a little later. Alternatively, you could have synthetic stocks, which are far more weather resistant and grippy feeling, or even combine this into a short bullpup design, which moves the mechanism further back down the gun and keeps the weight further back. And all that is done without sacrificing the barrel length. And the barrel length, of course, helps dictate the accuracy. The longer the barrel, the more accurate it can be. There are electronic guns which have an internal brain built in that determines the power per shot. It can even make the trigger fly by wire, so it is more of a switch and less of a pull type, which can ultimately move the gun around as you pull the trigger. Some of them have larger air cylinders underneath to gain higher shot counts, but this usually results in it looking like a bottle strapped to the underside of the barrel and some people really don't like this style. Personally, I quite like it and enjoy a much higher shot count, often up to about 400 or more shots per fill. These are just a few of the design options available and I would need a full program plus to try and go through them all. Ammunition. Well, this is another potential can of worms, but I'll try and keep this simple. When it comes to air rifles, the ammunition has pretty much always been lead pellets in one form or another and one calibre or another. Let's look at the calibre issue first, shall we? Years ago, there were pretty much two calibres available, 177, which is 4.5 millimetre, or 22, which is 5.5 millimetre. And it used to be 177 for target work, 22 for pest control. But with the increased number of different powered guns available, the calibre issue has changed considerably. Now, there are 177s, 0.20s, 0.22s, 0.25s, 0.30s, and they carry on upwards to 0.50 calibers. Yes, that's a 50 cal air gun. <laughs> Blimey. Each caliber does have a very good use and a reason and a need area. The lower power guns still stick predominantly to the 177 and 22 caliber, but the 0.20 is a much underused caliber and does indeed fit nicely between the two original calibers. 177 is smaller and lighter and as such travels faster velocities. 
and has a flatter trajectory. And as such, it's often more accurate because you don't need to make allowances for the arc of a heavier pellet over different distances. But the 0.22, because it's a heavyweight, retains a higher hitting power when it gets there and has more stopping power. The 0.20 therefore has a flatter trajectory than the 2.2 and yet more stopping power than the 177. So why aren't more of them sold? Well, because currently pellet manufacturers don't supply a lot of them, but maybe that will change in the future. So what about 0.25? Well, this is becoming more popular. It has higher hitting power, but is pretty much at the stretch of a sub 12 foot pound gun, but can be as flat a trajectory as a 177 in a higher power gun with some terrific stopping power due to its heavy weight. The same applies to the higher calibers. They simply need a higher power gun to bring out the best in them. The calibre is only part of the story though. The design is another issue and manufacturers have produced all shapes and designs for different needs. I have completed pellet reviews in the past if you want to look into this more. They are made in other materials other than lead, such as aluminium or aluminium, depending on which side the pond you're on. These are lighter and help increase your feet per second figures and can be used where lead is frowned upon. One of the latest types of ammunition being used is slugs. These are simply bullet shaped rather than the traditional Diablo shape and have high stopping power, but they may not suit all guns. So it's a little bit trial and error, I'm afraid. Sighting. Most PCP rifles come without sights and require external sighting aids. So let's look at a few options, shall we? This again is a whole subject on its own, but this is a beginner's guide, so I'll try to touch on the basics. Knowing there are loads of reviews and information available on the AAR channel. Rails first. On the top of the guns, there is a rail to be able to fit your preferred sighting aid. These basically come in three different types, Weaver, Picatinny and Dovetail. What's the difference? Well, basically width. A Weaver and Picatinny rail is a heavier, wider rail than a dovetail. The dovetail being quoted as 11 millimeters wide, but is often anything from nine and a half millimeters up to as high as 14. But nowadays, most manufacturers stick closer to the 11 millimeter standard. The Weaver and the Picatinny, however, are 20 millimeters wide and have a more military look to them. They have slots to help keep the scope in place in the event of recoil. The Picatinny rail is a more recent invention and has more regularly spaced, approximately five millimeter slots along the rail. Whereas the Weaver was the older design and has smaller slots, often not as regularly spaced. This information is so you can then mate up the correct scope rings with the relevant gun mount, but any gun shop worth their salt should be able to help and guide you with this. If they can't, well, you know the door you came in through, it works both ways. That's all I'm saying. So you know your mount, what are you going to put on it? There are loads of options, but basically people opt for a scope or telescopic sight. You could go for something like a red dot, but usually on rifles, you're looking for some magnification to help along the way. Again, I've done full programs on scopes and the best way to set them up or zero them as it is known. And it is best to take a look at that because sadly they don't just slot on the top and you can take the eyes out of a fly at 100 yards. They need to be matched up with your new rifle. Again, a shop should help you and guide you through the process. If not, there's always that door again. So, I'm sure everyone has seen films where the sniper looks through his scope and you can see the enemy in the crosshairs. That is pretty close to what a scope does, but to that you can add various levels of magnification, main tube size and glass size. So, a typical 3 to 9 by 41 inch scope has a magnification from 3 times, zooming right up to 9 times with a 40 millimeter objective lens through a one inch tube. Magnification is a personal thing and scopes can go pretty high. 
I have a 50 time scope here, which does a great job of bringing the target a lot closer. But any slight movement of the gun is exaggerated, so you will need to have it on a rest or the like. Most hunters prefer a little lower magnification, but target shooters often go for higher magnification. The tube size and the objective lens simply allow more light into the scope so everything is brighter and clearer, especially at dawn or dusk periods. A focus ring also aids accuracy and reduces a thing called parallax error, which is another thing that I have explained in the scopes reviews I've completed. Putting it simply, a non-focusing scope has, as you would expect, a fixed focal length. This can cause the effect of movement of the reticle a little like a close-up telegraph pole in relation to a far-off hillside. One moves more than the other. But in a fixed scope, the telegraph pole is the reticle and the faraway hillside is the target. And as you can see, you finish up slightly off target. So pay that little bit more for a focusable scope and this will be greatly reduced and improve your overall accuracy. This is about as far as I'm going to go into scopes at this point, but needless to say, there is a lot more to take into consideration certainly when you get more into the sport. Single or multi-shot? As I've already hinted at, one of the main reasons for going to PCPs rather than a lot of springers is the option of magazine-fed ammunition. I realise that companies such as Gamo are introducing multi-shot into their already excellent range of springers, but you still need to break the barrel each time, whereas on a PCP it often simply involves cocking the bolt or side lever, which can often be done without even coming off target. There are a whole range of magazines available by gun manufacturers with varying numbers of shots per magazine. Often the higher the calibre, the lower the magazine volume, simply because you can get a lot more 177 pellets into a set sized magazine than you can 0.30 or 0.50 pellets. For example, the standard Daystate magazine comes with 10 rounds in this 0.20 and 0.22 examples, but only five rounds in the 0.30 caliber. This isn't normally an issue because the higher calibers usually are in higher power guns and the air cylinders will give fewer shots anyway. Different manufacturers have their own styles and sizes of magazines. Here are a few examples and the loading methods that each one has. You'll also find that a lot of companies supply their guns in single shot format or supply them with a single shot tray option. This is because some people prefer to load each shot by hand and individually, mainly because it is possible to deform pellets either when you're loading them into the magazine or the magazines can, on occasions, deform the pellet as it is pushed into the back of the barrel. You also often find when the shooters use the single shot option, they also sort, weigh, clean and lube each pellet to try and get the maximum advantage. Does it work? Yes, to a certain degree, if you're using very poor quality cheap pellets or pellets that don't suit the gun, or more specifically the gun's barrel, then it's unlikely to turn it into a match grade target beating combination. So don't skimp on pellets. There are semi-automatic options becoming available from some manufacturers. 
which negate the need for the bolt or side lever to recock the gun between shots. A great idea for rapid fire, but again you will need to check the laws of your own country because here in the UK these are not really allowed. Barrels. We've just started to touch onto this subject and I won't go into it too much detail here. Just to say you should find the barrels on the guns are rifled, which means they spin the projectile in the barrel. This then continues spinning in flight and again aids accuracy. Some barrels are twisted the full length, some are smooth to start with, then twist at the end. Some are also specific on the number of twists per set length to help maximise the effect to the optimum and even match the ammunition being used, such as slugs. You'll find that some manufacturers produce their own barrels and designs, others will buy them in from respectable barrel manufacturers, such as Lothar Walther. You will need to lead a barrel in when you first get it, and that usually involves firing a full tin of approximately 500 pellets through when you first get it home, and believe me, it will impact prove the accuracy once you've done it. Cleaning a barrel is something that needs to be done from time to time, but not the same as powder burners. Often it doesn't need doing until you've put 1500 or 2000 pellets through, and then it's a simple process of using some shoot through cleaners or a pull through cleaner with a little cleaning oil. Cleaning kits are readily available and inexpensive and should form anybody's air gun kit. We have in fact done a video on this if you want to know more. Silencers. Yes, I said silencers. I often get pulled up for this, but the original patent was headed up silencer. Most people though refer to them or call them moderators or suppressors. I suppose because that's what they do. They don't actually silence the gun completely. But I, I don't care what people want to call them, but check it out in the patent office if you prefer. That aside, you will find that PCP air rifles are quieter than most Springer air guns because there isn't the same moving mechanism inside. The only real sound is from the end of the barrel. Some guns come pre-fitted with silencers, others come with a threaded end to the barrel to take an aftermarket option. Of which there are loads of options out there, and yes, you guessed it, I've completed comparison videos on these too. Naturally, some are better than others, but if you want to know more, then take a look at the reviews I've completed in the past. Some guns have a shrouded barrel which is designed to quieten the gun down, and these do work. Some even have shrouds and silencers, or at least still have the ability to fit an aftermarket silencer as well. Accessories. Well, it isn't so much a case of where do I start with this, but where do I end? As in most sports, there are so many aftermarket products to attract people to. It's impossible to list them all here, but I will just mention a few of the ones I consider to be most important. Other people may prefer other items, but I'm trying to look at this from the beginner's perspective. Bipods, pumps or compressors or air tanks, bags or cases, gun safes, cleaning kit, rangefinder, wind indicator, slings and swivels, bag rests or metal rests, lights, lasers or levels to stop the cant. These are just to name a few. Believe me, there are loads more, including targets, target traps, backstops. Again, check out some of my other videos on the subject. Costs. Finally, let's look at cost, shall we? The sky is the limit as far as the upper end is concerned, but to get you started with a good setup, you're going to need something in the region of about £500 UK. This will get you a quality PCP with a case, ammo and an excellent little scope, and even a pump to go with it. From here you can grow into the sport and then upgrade if you wish, but rest assured if you only wanted one gun and wanted a quality setup, this would last you for years and years, and be pretty darn accurate too. Well, that's it, it's been a pretty monumental task and hopefully has proven useful to many of the new guys wanting to start into this sport. If you have found it useful, please give us a thumbs up, don't forget to subscribe to be able to get much more content. Hit the alarm bell to be sure you get notified. We produce a new programme every Friday morning. And finally, and most importantly, please stay safe and shoot responsibly. 
and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.